It was a dark and cloudy evening. No, who am I kidding? It was a beautiful, bright, bright, sunny day. I was in Florida, my six-year-old self uh, and my family, and we were at the Everglades. It was gorgeous, but that heat with that humidity felt like the inside of my Labradoodle's mouth as you were moving along. And as we were walking along, we saw all of these little squirrels, brown squirrels, green squirrels, because they were covered in all the leaves, and a lot of gray squirrels. And with that picture, as I was walking with my dad and my mom and my sister, there were these signs, bright circles with a line through them, red signs that said, do not feed the squirrels. Do not feed the squirrels here, do not feed them here, do not feed them anywhere. Well, my father decided that we needed a treat and we went into an ice cream shop and I, my six-year-old self, got what type of ice cream? Chocolate, strawberry? Mint chocolate chip, of course, a kid's favorite, mint chocolate chip. So there I am eating my ice cream cone, and my dad, as we're walking along, takes a look at those signs, and he looks, and he says to himself, ah, I don't, this is not a warning, no, this is a challenge to be able to feed every squirrel that is in this Everglade area. So as we're walking, my father asks if he could have my ice cream cone for just a minute. And of course, being the dutiful, obliging daughter that I am, I obediently handed him my ice cream cone. So he takes a pinch of it, hands the rest back to me, and bends down to feed one of the squirrels. The squirrel takes, its, takes it in its paws. I mean, like these are domesticated rodents here. Just picked it right up, kind of gave a nod of thanks, and started to eat it. Well, as soon as that squirrel figured out where the rest of that ice cream cone was, up a four foot tall tree in pink jogging pants, it decided that this was an adventure it was ready to take on. So it scurried up my leg, up my torso, and tried to grab my ice cream cone. I was kicking, I was screaming, I was crying, my dad was laughing. <laughs> I held on to my ice cream cone with all my might. And I must say, the squirrel eventually ran down my leg, and I was victorious. I kept my sweet. But that's what it felt like then for the rest of the trip. Because, of course, my dad couldn't let up with that particular event. Every time we would pass a squirrel, whether we were at Universal or at Disney, he would sing the theme song from Jaws. Na 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 creating a little PTSD every time I see a squirrel. <laughs> so that's who I am, a six-year-old uh, at heart who just really, really despises squirrels. Um, <laughs> but I was able to keep my sugar cone. Uh, so to tell you a little bit more about what I'm here to talk to you about, the love and the beauty of narrative, the story. So first, we're gonna talk a little bit about what goes into a story. Second, we'll look at the theories behind storytelling narratives because that's what scholars do. We provide research for what we study. Uh, then we're gonna look at storytelling as a practice and you're gonna get a chance to tell a story of your own to your neighbor next to you. And if you would like, possibly to share to the community as a whole. And then finally, I'll give a few takeaways. Also for starters, um, I want you to watch this video. This is uh, from Jacob Frey, uh, a award-winning short film from 2016. It's called The Present. Some of you may have seen it before, others this may be your first time, but I want you to look at it with uh, new eyes as if you haven't seen it and think about the story that this short tells. All right, you got a chance to be able to see the present. Now, I would like to have you uh, tell me what you learned. What did you learn from this story? So if you are willing, I'd like you to participate in a poll everywhere. 
uh, text. So uh, to the address 22333, uh, text Kitty Grace, K-I-T-T-I-E-G-R-A-C-E, 636. And then I'd like to hear your thoughts. What did you, what did you learn from the story? In a, in a couple of words, because it's going to create a, a word cloud there. I love technology. All right, while you're, we'll see if they come up. If, who's willing to just shout out some of the responses that they had? Just shout them out loudly, if you would. Acceptance, acceptance. notions of acceptance. Relationships. Relationships. The power of shared experience. Power of shared experience. <laughs> notions of assumptions. Well, you all may have had a different experience as you were watching this video. I'm sorry the poll wouldn't work. That's my, my uh, lack of technology coming through. <laughs> um, so when you have those notions of difference with regard to how we engage in storytelling, it's going to be based on the experiences that we've had how we are going to engage with the, the entire process. Um, but the way that story works within our, our minds is very similar, whether it's me telling you a story about a, a squirrel that I was victorious over, or whether it be uh, an otherly abled boy who finds solace within a, a three-legged dog. Uh, you, you have a, a way and meaning in which story connects us all. And it does so actually through our mind in a different way than lecture, like what you're hearing right now, does, and differently in what facts and figures do as you are listening and, and taking in information of that sort. So the stories uh, tell us differences within our mind. It actually engages our mind more. Um, as you can see through uh, Lazarkus and Snow 2018, when you have a typical lecture-based style of learning, uh, you, language processing and language comprehension is, is how you're receiving information. But when you're looking at this notion of what a story does, you can remember more. More areas of your brain are highlighted because they are engaging more of your senses. So you have that emotion processing, you have the image sensation, you have emotional reactions, and the visual imaging as well. That all comes in to help impact your brain. So we are drawn in by stories all types of stories. That includes rumors that are told. It includes the tea that we share sometimes, sometimes other people's stories that we shouldn't be telling. Um, it impacts our brain more and makes us want to hear and communicate with others more. Therefore, we are hardwired to be entertained and influenced by the drama that is around us. Uh, and if there is a lack of story, like when you were watching the present, there is times when you're not sure why the boy was kicking the dog, you may fill in, we call that enthymeme in communication studies, you fill in that missing warrant. You fill in the silence if you don't find out more of the story. So as a result, we have a tendency to tell our own tall tales, and that's how narratives turn into rumors, which turn into uh, sometimes negative, toxic environments. And that's why workplaces can be toxic. Uh, some of our communities can be. Uh, the teams that we're a part of, it can become that way because the stories that we tell heightened our excitement and we keep coming back for more. That's why tabloids sell so well. Sensationalized. It's these notions of stories that pull us together. And it grows because our brain reacts to them and that is how we want to connect with others more, whether it be truth or, or uh, a little bit less than the truth. 
Um, so that's the, the notion of our, our stories impact our, our mind. Then when we look at the notion of how communication studies came onto this, uh, it was back in 1978 uh, by Walter Fisher, and it's a little fuzzy because this is his original work. Uh, he identified that the rational paradigm is wonderful and it's useful for us to be able to build our, our logical uh, sets and our logical arguments. However, the notion of a narrative paradigm is just as important and can be just as useful in helping to connect with other people. So we find this connection through the story, through his notion of narrative probability, or what we call narrative coherence, and narrative fidelity, or correspondence. So the notion of coherence is how a story sticks together. So telling that I was in Florida, moving through the squirrel running up my leg, uh, it, it sticks together. It's easy to understand the way in which it moves from point A to point B. Even Pulp Fiction, right? Uh, how many of you have actually seen that, that movie? Awesome, there, there's, a, there's a, a few. Uh, had very little coherence to it, right? At the beginning, you don't understand one story fit into the next, to the next, to the next, but at the end, you get the whole streamline and figure out, ah, oh, this is how it all fits together. So it eventually has that coherence. So you have to have some way in which the story fits together. Then this notion of fidelity is the other part that Fisher said. In order for us to communicate well with each other, it has to have a way for it to ring true to the people who are hearing it. It has to have significance to you. That's what makes it interesting. That's what makes you want to hear more. That's what makes it authentic to others. And so that's how we build relationships, is through telling stories that we logically can understand, one, and two, that we feel are significant to us. Uh, and this is uh, the way in which communication challenged that logical, rational paradigm and brought in narrative to our study as well. In order to be able to understand how narrative works well, uh, we have to uh, go to our English roots and take a look at this notion of the story arc, uh, which was um, recited in PA 2016. This is how a story can be told so that it impacts others and connects with others more completely. You have some type of uh, exposition. You, you give a little bit of, of the details of how it's set up. That is um, optional. But what isn't optional is that you have to have some type of conflict. There has to be some type of action that you're going to share. It has to move through time in some sort of way. Move up through that rising action as the squirrel rised up my leg and I got more anxious, right? Rising action up to the climax where I'm kicking and screaming and crying and holding onto my ice cream cone. That is the climax of the story, right? And then you have the falling action as the squirrel ran down my leg. I started to breathe a little bit better, and the resolution was that I got to continue to eat my ice cream cone. Mm -hmm. So you have that clear story arc. This arc has been shown uh, to help to, to pull people in. This isn't the only ways that stories get told. As long as you're being authentic, then you're able to help pull people in with that notion of fidelity. But this is what we use uh, in communication and very often within forensics uh, when we're trying to work on how to tell a prose story or a drama. You have to pull people in, give some type of rising action, allow them to feel the moment with the other person that's in the room, and then have some type of resolution. And I've been doing this now for 25 years uh, as a speech coach, um, as a speech competitor when I was a student. Um, and in that time, I've been uh, privileged to have coached two um, uh, second place uh, folks in pro speaking and three national champions, uh, one who's in our audience right now uh, in uh, pro speaking. And so this, this type of story arc has lasted for years. And if you're able to produce stories in this type of a, a way, um, it's one way that you can help connect to other people. 
All right, so the other part uh, is that often within the story, you, you want a, a character that you can connect to in some way. And so Lazarkus and Snow 2018 talk about that hero's journey. You know, think back to the Odyssey. Um, think back to um, when we would read hieroglyphics or were, would tell narratives before they were written down. They're very, very powerful in ways to be able to connect with us. And so so the, these stories, while they change over time, they often still have someone that you're rooting for at the root of it, right? So you still have the hero. Um, and, and the action of the story as well, because we are excited by that action. And we like to be the heroes in our own stories, right? So the others that are in our stories become the sidekicks or they become the villain. Uh, and that can create adversarial relationships between those of us that we are telling the story about. Um, so it has that tendency when we're building the narratives of our lives that we will create those who are a part of us with the sidekicks and those who are against us, those notions of the, the evil folks. Um, I mean, even in the version of my story, right, my dad becomes the villain, right? Um, and I, I told him I was gonna share this story and I asked his permission and, and he laughed and he said, you bet. And I said, you know, you don't look very good in this story, right? I mean, he's the one who, who helped to be able to, to support me, to be able to be uh, independent and to do whatever it was that I wanted to do. And yet I'm still able to tell, you know, this story when I was six and how he, he put the fear of squirrels uh, into me in, indefinitely. And, and, and he laughed and he said, yeah, what's new? <laughs> right, right, that, that, that he played the part of that, the villain. Um, and often our stories will have those archetypes, the, the good versus the evil. And that's what builds up relationships and what can tear down relationships as well. So that's, uh, a little bit about what we're looking at as far as story is concerned. So now I, I want to give you a chance to be able to develop a story. So if you have your iPads with you or your phones or, you know, heaven forbid, paper and pencil to write, um, I want you to take the next five minutes and I want you to think about a story that you would be willing to tell. This would be tell your, your neighbor, um, that, that, that type of tell. So here's what I want you to keep in mind. Those A, B, and C notions. So you want to start the story with action. Don't start it with this long prose or the long plot progression. People get marred in that plot progression and then they never get to the action and never get to the actual story. People get bored when they don't get to the action soon enough. Uh, so think about that action you want to make sure happens. Think about the vivid description that you want to share as well. Uh, what is it that you want to make sure that you get to resonate to your audience? And then finally, Reflect on a memorable statement. These are the three ways in which you want to be able to start your story. Action, think about vivid description, and think about that memorable statement. Um, this actually comes from one of our alums who happened to be my duo partner in speech, uh, Dr. Charles Parrott. He graduated in 2000. We were at the National Communication Association convention this last week, and he's taken a sabbatical and he's working on story writing. And I said, that's awesome, I'm giving a speech on this, it's going to be great. What can, I, what can I use to be able to help the people of the audience to, to share their stories. And so these were the tidbits that he had been working on uh, through his performance studies lens. Um, so that's what, I, that's what I want you to do. I want you to take five minutes. Uh, we'll turn on some little pump up music here. Uh, and I want you to think, think about the stories. This isn't share, we're not at share time yet. Just think about the story you want to tell and feel free to, to write down the notes that you need. All right, everybody. 
I hear that you've had a chance to be able to think through your stories um, and had a chance to be able to share. Uh, if those of you who were ruminating for the full five minutes, I'm going to give you now three minutes to be able to turn to a partner or to turn to a, a new partner uh, or to continue a story that you have started. I'm going to give you three minutes to be able to share the story that you have constructed within this space here. You have three minutes. Go ahead and share. All right, everybody. I could give you I could give you the rest of this presentation and longer to to be able to have this connection with one another. This is it's beautiful. It was wonderful to stand up here and hear how the stories would start and then the energy would grow as you would get through to the rising action. Uh, this is uh, the, the notion of our, our fantasy themes uh, within uh, communication studies and how they turn into to fantasy chains. And the, the more that you tell the stories, the more energy that occurs and, and the more that, that we get louder as we're trying to share our stories and, and be able to connect and commune with, with one another, which is really, really awesome to watch. Um, so thank you for participating. Um, you will get another opportunity to participate if you so choose to come to our Hastings uh, storytelling event, which is Friday evening. And I'll, I'll give you a little info about that in just a second. As uh, soon as I give you a few of my takeaways. Uh, my first takeaway is kind of pithy. Um, <laughs> it's this, this theory of the pink shirt. Uh, my friend Josh and I came up with this when we were in college so many years ago. Uh, and this is when you get so marred in the uh, plot development or having the specific time and the setting exactly right. We call it a pink shirt. So it's like, what? Was it Wednesday or was it Thursday that this happened? Uh, maybe it was Tuesday. Yes, I think it was Tuesday night because we were eating roast beef. Like, who cares, right? Like, that is not important at all. So pink shirt. Were they wearing a green shirt or was it a red shirt? Maybe, yeah, it must have been a pink shirt. So now you can't unsee that when you hear folks telling you stories and they kind of go on trying to figure out the dates and the times or whatever. You, you, you think about it as, ah, there's another pink shirt. A pink shirt moment, right? So, so work to try to keep your pink shirt moments to a minimum, if, if you can. Um, I'm, not always, I'm not always good at doing that, uh, but, but it's good advice. Uh, because people will stay connected to you the less pink shirts you, you have. Not in your wardrobe. Wear all the pink shirts you want. They're fantastic. But uh, keep it in your wardrobe. Um, my, my next takeaway is that, as, as we saw happening right here in the chapel, we were able to find that common ground through story and gain that notion of significance as we're coming together. And we uh, like narratives because it fuels our interests, our emotions, and our connections. And as storytelling and story listening beings, we enjoy the drama, uh, but we need to watch out for that. As my colleague uh, Jennifer and I were talking about in a coaching debriefing on November 8th, 2019, uh, I love this. She says, right, I, I won't start the drama, but I'll sure eat the popcorn and watch it around me, <laughs> right? So a lot of us, we will imbibe in those stories, in those negatives, not as the ones that are telling it, but as the ones that are hearing those stories. And we sometimes really want to absorb those messages. And so that's my warning, is that we want to try to have a little more drama mean, get rid of the drama, and focus on connection instead. And so that's, that's what I'll, I'll leave you with, is work on that authentic connection by being authentic to yourselves and recognize if you're participating in the drama and try to remove that, but instead try to work to tell your own story as authentically as possible. And one way to do that is to, to join uh, 
uh, Dr. Kennedy and myself on Friday night in the Scott Studio Theater at six o'clock. Uh, you get to tell your own story. We will choose eight to 10 folks to be able to share their stories. Five minutes is the limit. The theme this month is thankfulness. So what are you thankful for? Something that you could share in five minutes. Uh, you, if you were the winner, uh, will get a gift card from the bookstore and you will be a participant in our Grand Slam, which occurs an academic showcase day in April. And if you are one of two winners at the Grand Slam, you get the opportunity to go to a moth event um, where you get to choose which one you want to go to and the plane and the lodging and food is paid for, uh, all because of an innovation grant that uh, Dr. Kennedy and I had applied for. Um, so so please come and participate. Uh, if you don't want to tell a story and you're better at the listening side of things, come and listen because you get to be in the audience and get to help choose who the winners are of the storytelling. So if you, if you have uh, no plans at the beginning of your Friday night, six o'clock pretty early, uh, come on over and come and listen to some thankfulness stories and, and see how we can connect and become a little more authentic. Uh, and with that, I just leave you with working on your narratives, help to tell the best story that you can of yourselves. And I just want to say that's the end. <laughs>